I think it's a good thing when other people come and share God's word. Uh, it's, it is a break for me. Um, it's a break from me. So it works both ways, right? Uh, and, and I especially enjoy when people within our church family come and give the message. Um, we hear a different voice. We get a different perspective. And we can all learn together. So this morning it is a great privilege to invite once again Linda Gentry to come and to share the word with us today. Before I start with what I prepared to say, I will say what God prepared me to say. <laughs> um, as usual, when I step up here, I am extremely humbled. I am this close to tears because I've been allowed to do this. God has given me the words. God has given me the strength. God has humbled me so many ways in the last 24 hours. Uh, and not the least of which was someone who came forward this morning and prayed with me and for me. Thank you. Um, hope I get through this. <laughs> when the Holy Spirit touches my heart, for some reason it makes tears flow. I'm not sure exactly why. But anyway, um, I was born and raised on a farm in Maroa, humble beginnings, believe me, wearing um, my boy cousin's hand-me-down clothes. And my job as a child was to raise the chickens. And when the baby chickens came in the spring, we, had, we got 100 chickens, and it was my job to take each one out of the box, dip their little beaks in whatever it was my dad put in that water uh, that was supposed to keep them from getting sick. And then it was my job to take care of those ch baby chickens uh, until they were either eaten or used for laying hens. Now, if they were eaten, I didn't get anything out of that but the food. But if they were used for laying hens, then um, when people bought the eggs, I got the money for raising the chickens. And that's how I earned my money. And everything was going along beautifully until the day that the handle on the ice pick that was holding the latch on the brooder house door shut rotted and fell off. And the, and the, the ice pick fell through the latch, and the door flew open, and 100 chickens, my livelihood, was out there running loose in the yard, and they had, they weren't babies anymore, they were just at this stage, you know, where they start to get their feathers, and they were running everywhere, and I'm out there trying to chase. Have you ever tried to chase 100 chickens? <laughs> <laughs> when your legs are only like this long? <laughs> and you're wearing your red rubber boots because you had those on to go out and feed them so they wouldn't peck your feet anymore. So there I am out there running around in my red rubber boots trying to chase these chickens. They're going everywhere. They're under buildings. They're in the garden. They're running between my legs. When I try to catch them, they were everywhere. And I have never, ever forgotten that day. But sometimes I wonder if God ever feels that way about us. He created us with love and plans for us. And he knows what's best for us, but what do we do? We wait with bated breath for the latch to fall off so we can take off on our own. We scatter to the four winds, but since we're smarter than chickens, and believe me, I think there is any, nothing that is any more dumb than a chicken. Everybody and everything is smarter than a chicken. And we, those of us who are smart, return to God's wings. We come to church on Sunday mornings, we sing, we learn, we pray, we worship. In fact, every Sunday morning, we stand up at the end of our church service and we pray the Lord's Prayer. Do we listen to those words or do we just say them? Do we mean those words? Well, of course we do. We're praying from with our heads bowed and our hearts towards God, and we say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. 
And then what do we do? We walk right out those doors and we start complaining. Thy will be done. And usually, for me anyway, I'm guilty of complaining about the weather. Man, it is so beastly hot today. I tell you, I'll be so glad when it cools off. Or maybe you're a farmer. I know a little bit about farmers. Maybe you're a farmer and it's the middle of summer and it's dry and you say, man, do we ever need rain? It is just so dry, we need rain. Or maybe you say, I can't believe this, I just washed my car and it's raining out there today. Or maybe we complain about other things. Well, and this is dated because I did this in July. There may probably going to be a long wait at Ted's again today. Or we say, I tell you, if my grandkids show up today and mess up that house after I spent all day yesterday cleaning, I am not going to be happy. Thy will be done. Or maybe we aren't complaining. Maybe we're just giving advice or passing judgment or being critical of someone else. Or maybe we mean well and are reaching out in concern, but still in the back of our minds wondering why God has allowed such a thing to happen. Thy will be done. Do we really want God's will to be done his way? Or do we want God's will to be done our way? Or do we want him to just simply step aside and let us do things our own way? Sort of like those escaped chickens. Are we able to step across that fine line between what we want to happen and trusting God? Isn't that dividing line called trust? Now I'm going to share something with you from my life, not for sympathy, not for a minute, but so that you know that I'm speaking from my own experience here. I don't have all the answers. No, I don't have any of the answers, I gotta tell you. Um, but I got a mouth, so here I am. But God's still teaching me. He's still showing me grace. And it's just my hope that through that grace that God has shown me, that maybe I can help some of you through a difficult time. Now, as some of you know, my mother is languishing in bed and has been for a year and a half. She is withering away. We figure she's probably down to about 85, 80 pounds. And she knows some people, but not much else. And let me tell you that as I stand before you this morning, and as I speak to you, I speak from the experience of jumping back and forth over that line of trust so many times that I've lost count. One morning I may be trusting God completely. Okay, Satan, not today. You are not doing this to me today. And what happens? Satan and his band of hooligans, who I like to call the what if gang, show up and they start trying to make me take over my own problems. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if? What if? By lunchtime, I'm worrying and I'm doubting and I'm taking over my own problems. And by supper time, I'm full blown into complaining. Thy will be done. By bedtime, I've ridden that roller coaster of God's will, trust God, worry, trust myself, and even doubting God that I am half sick. And then I wonder why I don't sleep well sometimes. As Paul Tripp says in his book, New Morning Mercies, we all want to rule our own worlds each of us has times when we see authority as something that ends freedom rather than gives it. Each of us wants God to sign the bottom of our personal wish list, and if he does, we celebrate his goodness. And I would add to that, at times, we not only want God to sign off on the bottom of our wish list, we also feel the need to tell him how to do his job. A character in the book, The Warmth of Other Sons by Isabel Wilkerson, which is a nonfiction book, and the character I'm quoting was a real lady, she said, now we ain't got nothing to do with God's business. She was right. We ain't got nothing 
to do with God's business. Thy will be done. So how do we stop the roller coaster? How do we trust God so completely that we stop complaining? How do we comfortably let God be God and take care of his own business? How do we, and taking care of his own business, that's taking care of us. How do we stop Satan and his band of hooligans, the what if gang? First, we have to remember that we are God's business. We are the crowning glory of his creation. We are his much loved children. Don't ever doubt that. 2 Corinthians 6.18 says, And I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. He always knows what's best for us, and he always brings out the good in even the worst of situations. Genesis 50, 19 through 20 says, But Joseph said to them, them being his brothers, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. How can we say, thy will be done, if we aren't willing to wait on God to do his will? How can we see the good if we're blinding ourselves with complaints and focusing on what we think should be done? Now, trusting God is not a one-time cure. It's not like getting an infection, getting a shot of penicillin, and when you walk out of the doctor's office, you know that in a few days you're going to be cured and you're going to be well. Trusting God doesn't work that way. It is a day-by-day, hour-by-hour, sometimes minute-by-minute process. It's like forgiveness. You can't forgive a person once and never have to do it again. And I would hate to admit to you how old I was before I realized that. Matthew 18, 21 and 22 says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I give, forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Whoa, Peter. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. In other words, you just forgive, keep forgiving. And in other words, you just keep trusting. Not seven times, not 77 times, but countless times, endlessly. Because Satan and that what if gang is coming at you all the time. What if this happens? What if that happens? Oh, have you thought about this? I can only tell you what has helped me and what I hope will give some of you an idea of what might help you to let God's will be done without a fight. Because guess what? His will is going to be done whether we like it or not. Secondly, we must be grateful and stop complaining. You know, a pastor said to me once, you know, when I'm preaching, I'm not just preaching to the congregation, I'm preaching to myself, and I came back with, are you listening? Well, guess what? I'm asking myself right now, am I listening? <laughs> Secondly, I said that. We must be grateful and stop complaining. Colossians 3.15 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Philippians 2, 14 and through 16 says, do everything, it doesn't just say what you want to, it says do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like the stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And you know, I thought about that. You stop and think about that. This is the Bible written so many, 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 many years ago, and they're talking about a warped and crooked generation. What we're going through today is nothing new. It's been going on since Adam and Eve. Okay, going back to Paul Tripp's book, he said, the lifestyle of complaint and gratitude are both rooted 
in the way you view yourself. Okay, now that's worth repeating. The lifestyle, have you stopped to think about lifestyle, about complaining being a lifestyle, gratitude being a lifestyle? The lifestyle of complaint and that of gratitude are both rooted in the way you view yourself. When we see ourselves as the center of our world, we only see things as the way we think they should be. Think back to the examples at the beginning of this message. I want the weather to be my perfect temperature between 70 and 75. Well, maybe somebody else likes between 80 and 85, but I don't care. I want it between 70 and 75. Or maybe I want to go to a restaurant and be treated like I am the only one there. It's my expectations, my comfort level, and my desires that make me grumble because I'm guilty of thinking that the world revolves around me. It's only when we realize and remind ourselves every day that we are not the center of the universe and that we are sinners who deserve nothing but God's wrath and that in acts of amazing grace, God is merciful and kind to us and that every good thing we have is a gift from him where we have reasons to be grateful. Now that was a huge run-on sentence, which gives me goosebumps. So I'm going to break it down and I'm going to repeat those, those tenets that were in there because they're too important to just gloss over. We must realize and remind ourselves every day that we are not the center of the universe. Nehemiah 9.6 says, you alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, the earth and is all that is on it, and the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of the heaven worship you. Now, because we are sinners, we will eventually go back to believing that the world should operate the way we think is best, and then mistakenly believe that God needs our advice. Well, guess what, gang? He doesn't. He doesn't need our advice. Acts 17, 24, and 25 says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives life and breath and everything else. Because we are sinners, we deserve nothing but God's wrath. But fortunately, he sees it differently. In acts of amazing grace, God is merciful and kind to us. John 1, 16 and 17 says, out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. And I don't mean to leave you two out. <laughs> For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Every good thing that we have is a gift from him. I chose that call to worship this morning because we need to be reminded who Jesus is. Jesus is, and where he is, he is the greatest gift that anyone could have ever given. He is also always found in the places where we least expect him, hanging between two thieves, like the song said. James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift is from above, Jesus, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. When we look at everything we have as an undeserved blessing, we will be astounded at how grateful we will become and gratefulness will become a lifestyle. Now on our own, we crawl right back on that roller coaster of trust God, worry, trust myself, worry, etc. But fortunately, we're not on our own. We don't have to do this on our own. 
Okay, now we're all familiar with Philippians 4, 6 that says, do not be anxious. Anybody who knows Larry Larson knows this, this scripture. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. But do we also believe verse 7? And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Our hearts and our minds will be guarded by Christ Jesus. Jesus is the guard of our hearts and our minds. Paul doesn't say that we have to do it ourselves. Let's go ahead and read through verse 9. Finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, not me, but but uh, Paul put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. And I repeat, and the God of peace will be with you. And who doesn't want peace? So I say to you, my brothers and sisters, focus not on your problems. Focus not on yourselves. Focus on whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, because God is all of those things. When we focus on those things, we're taking our focus off of ourselves and putting it on God where it should be. We have to trust God in all things, all the time. He knows that we can't do this on our own. He didn't create us to do this on our own. He created us to need him. Needing him helps us to love him more, and that's what he wants from us. So when we pray this morning and every morning, thy will be done, I hope those words stick in your head and like, oh, let us all ask God to help us mean it, and then ask him to help us do it and let him do it.